once you see Facebook Live, you can start. Okay. Okay. Welcome to what we call a parallel session to the ADB's energy consultation, which is going on on a virtual platform, but we think is not inclusive enough at the ACEF, which is the Asia Clean Energy Forum. Some of us think that the ADB has never really been clean that they are posturing with what they call a clean energy policy, which we think needs to get cleaned up. And that is why we have decided to have this parallel session. I'll call upon Ryan Hassan of the um, NGO Forum on ADB, the executive director, to tell us why the forum decided to disengage with the ACEF process. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vidya, and good afternoon, good morning, good evening to everyone. Um, well, Asia Clean Energy Forum has been uh, something that we were very excited about. Uh, so it's with deep regret, actually, that we have this, we had to take this position to not engage formally into uh, the conference itself. Um, just a little bit of background. We've been um, trying to engage meaningfully into the Asian Clean Energy Forum over the last 10 years. And uh, it has always been an uphill battle to get doors open formally into the process for civil society to engage. And over the last, uh, last five years, the conversation around the climate crisis, post Paris agreement, the bank's um, rhetoric around energy and transition and stance on fossil fuels, all of those issues begged for civil society to be consulted, actually, because at the end of the day, when you're looking at the climate crisis itself, it, it is hitting coastal uh, communities. It is hitting um, DMC member countries where there is high incidence of inequality. Um, and it is changing the way agriculture happens and how we all survive and adapt to climate change. So if uh, if we don't have a meaningful role to discuss the realities on the ground, then what kind of clean energy transition are we talking about, right? So the decision-making system within the ADB limits itself to the private sector, to the governments themselves, and to the financiers, and with no role for the people to participate in the decision-making process. So with that, overall context in mind, we continually pushed for space in the ASAP. And while all this was happening in 2020, the energy policy of the ADB went up for review. Uh, the energy policy consultation process is one of the policy consultation processes which NGO Forum on ADB is engaging in. We are also simultaneously engaging in the safeguards policy review process under the same department, which is the Sustainable Development Climate Change Department, right? So if you look at the safeguards process, we are arguing the terms and conditions of the consultation process itself through a stakeholder engagement plan, which looks at not only uh, consultations with the forum itself, but consultations in country perspectives, in thematic perspectives, what kind of research and background goes into the policy formulation and how we can all input. So this completely, uh, diverse approach from SDCC on the way it deals with the safeguards policy review and the energy policy review is just the differences between night and day at this point. So 2020, we had to engage in the process. Um, and we did this by taking a proactive stamp, uh, stance by reaching out to Director Yong Ping Zai's office and asking him to participate in consultations with us, which he graciously accepted. And we thank him for that. And we had a series of consultations on various thematic issues, all of you have participated, leading on to, I guess, uh, some critical input towards what we now see as the first draft of the policy released in May 15. But throughout this entire period of August 2020, all the way till where we are now in June 15, if you looked at the energy policy website, you haven't really seen SDCC explain what the energy policy consultation is. After repeated requests through letters and direct um, 
inquiries, we really did not get much response from the energy team doing this review at the Asian Development Bank. So here we are um, hoping that after the May 15 draft was released after the annual meeting, uh, that we would see an ASAP for the first time, which would be more inclusive and more respective of what's happening within the energy policy consultation. Unfortunately, I do not want to go into the details of dates and times and what was uploaded and not uploaded. The bottom line is at the end of the day, the notice was very, very short. I think four or five days ago, we were given notice to organize a discussion. Um, we just sent out a letter in the morning to Director Yongping Zai's office, the NGO center, all the board of directors that the platform over which this said consultation was supposed to be held in the ASAP would be one way flow of transmission. There is no way to have a back and forth discussion. Um, it was uh, going to be deeply moderated by the ADB as to even what kind of questions will be asked. So considering the timing, uh, the opacity of the process, and lastly, the, I guess, askewed nature of the platform itself, we decided to decline this particular invitation. And we do hope that we can continue uh, having a much more constructive discussion with the ADB on this energy policy review um, through, I guess, a much more informed discussion in a venue which is neutral, in a venue which is inclusive, so we were hoping that we would definitely provide our critical inputs to the draft, send it prior to the bank during this review process, and then invite the ADB to come into, uh, I guess, an online neutral platform where we can possibly have a much more deeper and meaningful consultation over the very critical issues of fossil fuel finance, over renewable energy, and over climate responsibility. So I guess that's that's why we're all here today and looking forward to hearing from everybody else. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. The hope, of course, is that the NGO Forum and all its associates across the world can teach the ADB a thing or two about meaningful uh, consultation. Um, the NGO Forum, of course, is a network which is Asian-led civil society groups together and uh, groups from Central Asia, from South Asia and Southeast Asia. And it is um, our collective leadership on the ground that has uh, pushed at NGO Forum on ADB to take this stance because we do not consider um, either the review process of the new draft policy or the ASEF process um, a transparent, inclusive or meaningful um, consultation process. And therefore, we are disengaging, uh, but as Ryan pointed out, we are disengaging uh, to engage meaningfully in the future. Um, I call upon our Central Asia member, Ikram, to please tell us what they think from Central Asia. Thank you very much, Vidya. Thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Uh, we fully agree and support uh, the point uh, uh, uh highlighted points from uh, by uh, ryan and as for central asia uh we uh, i'm also uh, want to add some comments and uh, uh about the situation and uh, it's highly misled and uh, unacceptable for adb management to contact a network of uh, widely dispersed ngo across the region in the week leading up to the ac to offer uh, uh, seasons label as uh, CSO con consultation, which is in reality non-interactive online platform. It seems uh, it's uh, highly taxonical, patronizing, and single site. As a member of broad-based group, inclu inclusive of systemically marginalized group, including ethnic minorities, women, and youth from all walks of life, who know uh, and feel firsthand in impact of the ADB's investment in large-scale energy projects, we express our deep frustration of the way in which ADB suggests that they can incorporate our perspective as if uh, it's a uh, simple matter of the checking and tick box of policy consultation. Uh, with no meaningful attempt to engage with us uh, or 
our concerns. We also note uh, with particular indignation that the decision allocated uh, for a consultation uh, coincides uh, with the only uh, session allocated during the SU for discussion of uh, specifically on the Central Asia. A living, uh, a living civil society unable to listen and ask the question in timely manner during this, uh, this session if we were in engaged in the time slot allocated by the ADB for us uh, to listen and interact on the matter related to the energy policy. This is a simple not acceptable uh, trade-off and the season, uh, season could easily have been scheduled later in a week not overlapping with a specific regional or deep uh, dive panel discussion. Meanwhile, in relation to the centralized uh, session, uh, we note uh, no civil society voices from the region have been invited as respondents. Instead, this uh, session is uh, entitled uh, Decarbonization in Central Asia, Managing a Reserves uh, Capacities to Support Development of Large-Scale Renewable Energy. Featured speakers from the French Energy Transmission Network and ADB, rather than being grounded in the relates in the needs of the people across the Central Asia. That's why we, one more time, highlighting that we need engagement. We need to be heard uh, by ADB and uh, engaging of all the civil society representatives on the all the stage of the discussion and accepting of the such of policies and documents. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ikram. Um, our team from Central Asia is always very, very firm on what they believe and say and their push on the ground is what is very, very important to us. Um, I'll now call upon our seed uh, and we have Avril from seed here. Avril, um, I mean, the energy policy gave some hope, but they're also leaving um, open a range of options. And uh, what do you think about uh, what the draft new energy policy is saying and what will it mean for communities on the ground that have been grappling with bad uh, energy policies of the ADB till now where are perhaps thinking, oh, they're gonna get out of coal, this seems much better. What does it really look like to a group like SEED? Thank you, Vidya. Um, SEED, the Center for Energy, Ecology and Development, um, will first uh, allow me to say that we joined the forum and the you know several other organizations present here today in calling for a more transparent and inclusive process. The issue on uh, the, the current draft policy regarding coal and gas and um, these are uh, concerns that we had wanted to raise if there is a transparent and, and participatory process. Unfortunately, we had to disengage, but um, some of the points that we, we wanted to um, raise to, to the ADP from the perspective of, of the Philippines, just to share briefly on, on coal, beyond that, the coal ban and, and the coal phase out policy, we think that ADP should also look into active loan agreements um, th there is still an active loan agreement for Jamshara coal plant and other fossil fuels, and we urge ADB to focus also on retiring and decommissioning existing ADB funded coal projects, especially those that have become unreliable and obsolete. Just for instance, ADB funded Pagbilao coal plant here in the Philippines, which started operations in the 1990s, has been go going on unplanned outages every year, and at one point charged us with 600% more than the average generation rate of coal plants here. Um, we also wanted to raise issues on, on Paris alignment. While, while we're glad that this is now a priority in the policy, it, it is still silent on the temperature goal. And we know through the IPCC special report on global warming of 1.5 that pathways can differ drastically depending on the goal. So we call on ADB to align to the 1.5 goal which can only be met if you reach carbon neutrality or real zero by, by mid-century. While we see this language in the policy when it comes to gas projects, we ask ADB to expand this goal to the entire energy operations. And of course, to better align with the 1.5 Paris goal, 
We also urge ADB to expand the coal ban and, and phase out policy to all fossil fuels. Several, several reports came out in the past few months, the IEA net zero report, UNFCCC's NDC synthesis report. And, and these reports say that we are in a global red alert and we need rapid decarbonization to happen if we are to meet 1.5. So we urge ADB to focus financial flows to renewable energy solutions and scale up ambitions and let other financial institutions fund gas if necessary and, and economically viable in a DMC's energy transition. Um, finally, uh, there's a, a position in, in the policy in support for privatization. And it has been 20 years since the Philippine power industry was privatized with the technical assistance of ADB. Today, we're in this pandemic experiencing power, power rate spikes, bill shocks, power outages, grid instability, with government grossly incompetent in holding the power oligarchs accountable. We have coal plants going on yearly outages, including ADB funded coal plants. We have one of the most expensive electricity in, in, in Asia, second only to Japan. So we're paying for world, uh, first world prices for third world electricity services. And, and the promises of privatization remained just promises. So we urge ADB to reconsider its position and to support and assist DMCs in assessing the real impacts of privatization and deregulation in their contexts and restructuring their indus industries yet again. I'll end there. Thank you, Vidya. Thank you, Avril. Um, and so it's very clear that the ADB has, um, has been pursuing and continues to pursue um, a not so clean agenda in Asia. Um, the ASEF itself has, um, uh, you know, is, is put together um, alongside the ADB with USAID and uh, as one of the co-organizers and five out of seven donor agencies of the ASEF are from uh, the northern countries. Um, I'll call upon Hassan Mehdi to reflect upon the bias towards uh, the global north that this Asian Clean Energy Forum obviously carries. And, um, and also, um, you know, any response to the workshop, the side events that are all lined up for us, um, are they really community led? Um, and, and do they actually think that they can push a decentralized renewable energy system in, um, in your country, Mehdi, which is Bangladesh? Uh, Mehdi uh, represents the Bangladesh Working Group on External Debt and Clean, um, in Bangladesh. And also, Mehdi, speak for all of South Asia, because really many of our issues are all so similar. Thank you very much, Bidya. Uh, the problem is uh, uh, we, uh, as a South Asian civil society groups, uh, we took a decision earlier than forum to boycott uh, non-engagement uh, non with this uh, uh, SEEF, uh, Asia Clean Energy Forum. Uh, so I think I should read out the statement of South Asia, rather speaking on Bangladesh. Uh, please give me some time to read out the whole, uh, only five minutes to read out the thing. Uh, and that is our common position. I think other, uh, our other friends who are not here and who are uh, not speaking in this, uh, uh, this uh, alternative session, I think they will be happy to see their voices as they are. Uh, Granted, Mehdi, because we've <laughs> asked around and all of South Asia stands with the statement. So, yes, a quick read, though, and yeah. go ahead and edit as you read. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so the SEF is neither Asian nor clean. We, the representative of South Asian civil society, are boycotting the Asia Clean Energy Forum being organized by Asian, Asian Development Bank in association with United States Assistance for International Development, USAID, and Korea Energy Agency, KEA. The SEEF itself has its own identity crisis. Alongside the ADB, USAID is one of the two co-organizers of SEEF, with five out of seven donor agencies of SEF are from Northern countries. The bias toward the richer Northern countries is also reflected in the workshop and side events. Community-led decentralized renewable energy systems are not included in the agenda, while there is a long list of 
technology, investments, and policy reform. The ADB regularly organizes the SEF while their hands remain dirty with the, their fossil fuel investments and commitments. ADB has been promoting a private-led fossil fuel energy system in Asia, especially in the South Asian countries. According to its annual report in 2021, ADB has invested around $33.76 billion in the energy sector of South Asia, which is 25.77% of total investment in the region. Out of the total energy investment, only 2.13% has been investment in renewables, while 61.93% is towards fossil fuels directly and 34.21% for transmission and distribution. ADB is still invest financing the devastating Zamshoro coal power plant in Pakistan, Upper Trishuli One hydropower project in Nepal, Rupsha LNG based power plant in Bangladesh, and liquefied natural gas power generation to diversity, uh, diversify energy mix project in Sri Lanka, which are not only emitting excessive greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, but also destroying the national economy, local environment, and livelihoods. In India, ADB is promoting northern corporations like Goldman Sachs, uh, Shashio Sachs, uh, CDPQ, uh, Proparco, etc., uh, in the guise of promoting renewables. It is after the it is after the tireless efforts of various people's movements and civil society organizations that the Asian Development Bank finally decided to end their investment in coal. Decades long struggle of the climate and social justice movements celebrated this as a victory of our collective action. But ADB uses this opportunity to brand itself as a prophet of clean energy, while even their own coal divestment declaration is not ambitious enough to mention an immediate and complete phase out of coal. This energy policy too is still far from being clean. The draft energy policy allows retrofitting the existing coal plants and considers funding fossil gas, especially LNG and OSP energy, which are just another form of uh, dirty energy. The ADB has used the COVID-19 pandemic to avoid robust and meaningful consultation while marginalized communities, including but not limited to ethnic minorities, indigenous peoples, people with disabilities, women organizations, LGBTs, and Dalit, uh, and Dalit populations are systematically excluded from the consultation process. At the same time, the ADB has been implementing a number of energy-related projects in different countries across South Asia. Indeed, according to ADB's own independent evaluation of the sector, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh have been among the top uh, five countries at the receiving end of ADB energy-related loans and advice over the past decade. Yet, if the ADB is intent upon partnering with our governments and the private sector to roll these projects out, why can't they organize meaningful policy consultation at the community level? Illustrative of this approach in the South Asia regional uh, session featured at this year's SEF. The headline is digitalization of electricity utilities in South Asia, which is going to happen on 16 June. It appears completely out of, out of touch with the realities of the communities within the region in terms of what would be appropriately scaled uh, energy solution, promoting uh, EVs, uh, liberalization of electricity markets, and ever increasing uh, private sector participation in electricity distribution. We note that panelists during the session come from private and government sectors, including, for example, uh, Global Smart Energy Federation India, Ministry of Power India, Bangladesh Power Development Board Bangladesh, Ceylon Electricity Board Sri Lanka, and Electricity Regulatory Commission Nepal. Meanwhile, no airtime is allocated for any representation from civil society groups or networks. To date, there has been no evident transparency in the process of consultation designated within SEF and no possibility of people from the region to give meaningful input within the framework of accountability. When we know our perspective are being accounted for, as such, we demand that instead of posturing on clean energy, the ADB must first come up with a roadmap that, that categorically and clearly lays out 
the path towards an Asia that is 100% uh, powered by renewable energy. It is only through this way, uh, this that we can fi finally say that the energy forum they are, they are regularly organizing is truly Asian and clean. Second, an energy policy through the meaningful consultation with, with the affected and diversified communities on the ground and civil society at national, regional, and global level is necessary. Otherwise, the Asian Clean Energy Forum, ACEF, and energy policy will be treated as just another set of ornamental uh, arrangements for ADB's public image, apparently intended to speak to, the, to its donor countries and prospective private sector business partners only. And that is why we, the South Asian civil society, cannot participate in SEA process, which clocks them in green, glossing over, over their destructive track record across the region. Thank you very much, Vidya. Thank you, Hassan Mehdi, for reading out the um, statement from South Asia. And Jen, I'm sure from the forum is going to see that this is available to everyone, including those in the ADB. Um, as Mehdi said, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and India, uh, together with Nepal and Sri Lanka, have been at the receiving end of a uh, lot of energy-related loans, uh, transport loans, etc., and plenty of advice to our governments on how to uh, take forward things in the energy sector. But we do not think that we need to um, engage and sit at their table at the ASEF. Uh, we want them to really organize meaningful consultations, otherwise we will not be part of it. And we shall reach out to them and hopefully uh, they will come to our table. Um, I'll call upon Yobel uh, from um, Gaia to tell us what they think of ADB's plans uh, on waste to energy and also what it says in their energy policy draft. Thank you, Fidia. So Gaia is a worldwide alliance of more than 800 grassroots groups and individuals that fight for a just, toxic-free world without incineration or waste burning. And we are simply frustrated with ADB's continued support to waste to energy investment over the year. They keep wanting to burn waste and call it climate solution. And they also state um, that waste to energy improve local environment and health and create sustainable livelihood. Yet we believe this, we believe this is only another trust stall done by the bank to label a false solution as a clean low carbon solution. So here are some of our critics on the policy draft. So first, thermal waste to energy, such as incineration, is carbon intensive. Continued use of waste incineration is simply delaying a much needed and urgent transition to less carbon intensive power generation infrastructure, such as wind and solar. So once we phase out coal, thermal waste to energy becomes the most polluting source of energy. And it is recorded in European waste to energy incineration, it produced high level of carbon intensity, but twice greater than the current EU average electricity grid carbon intensity. So this is not like what the draft said, uh, supporting low carbon transition in Asia and Pacific. And on the other side, it's also noted by the US EPA that incinerator emits more carbon dioxide per megawatt hour compared to coal, natural gas, or oil-fired power plants. It's very important that both fossil carbon dioxide and biogenic carbon dioxide counted from the waste to energy facility. And this is not clearly stated in the draft policy. And it's ton of municipal solid waste or other type of waste uh, burned. It typically releases 0.7 to 1.7 tons of CO2. So we also have seen a lot of waste to energy facilities around the world in the US and Europe. It failed due to inefficiency in generating energy and also financial aspect. And this also create carbon lock-in effect in the long-term strategy on our goal to climate target. Second, 
waste is not renewable energy, and yet ADB still insists in this energy draft and also in the previous energy policy that waste is renewable. Yet the IPCC and the EU Renewable Energy Directive, for example, they narrow down the definition of renewable energy uh, from municipal waste only to its organic waste fraction. Yet in one paragraph in the draft, it suggested that waste alongside gaseous fuel, biomass uh, is included as a renewable energy source. Burning biomass using waste to energy system is problematic. We have seen in some countries, for example, in Indonesia, without clear criteria, without strong policy, it can lead and accelerate deforestation. Um, rather than thermal waste to energy, we, we promote um, biological waste to energy, yet ADB keep lumping every technology in one terminology, which is waste to energy. So this confuses us as civil society when they say they want to promote waste to energy, but they keep pushing for burning waste in the thermal process, which is basically incinerator. And also there is strong policy and legal basis if we see on the paragraph 90 that we should remove waste as part of renewable energy because um, now ADB's assistants are heavily focused on capacitating DMCs um, to put burning waste facilities in the country. And this basically um, doesn't align with the Paris Agreement or even other international conventions such as Stockholm on waste management in order to achieve circular economy and sustainable energy production goal. Third, that thermal waste to energy that is typically supported by ADB is the most expensive way, again, the most expensive way to handle waste. And it does not remove the need for landfill as the draft suggested. It is not the least cost stable energy supply as mandated in one paragraph in the draft, but with, continuous, uh, with countries moving towards reduction of waste generation, thermal waste to energy will become inflexible in the longer term, and it can create fit stock lock-in, meaning when cities are moving towards significant waste reduction, um, banning plastic, for example, the waste to energy facility needs a big amount of waste in the long term. And this can hinder national waste reduction targets, such as what we see in, for example, Indonesia, they have 30% waste reduction target and waste to energy doesn't fit this target. Also, many countries in Asia Pacific don't have the financial capacity to fund this. Um, in Indonesia, again, they have a problem to finance this technology and they are burdened, local government are burdened by a very high tipping fee for waste incinerator. And for this very reason, uh, WTE incinerator in Jakarta has been delayed indefinitely. Um, and the Corruption Eradication Commission of Indonesia stated that waste incinerator pose high financial risk. Um, and this is even more a problem to small islands developing states because they cannot really afford it. And also there will be a problem with the toxic ash generated from the incinerator. Um, and for that support for waste to energy magnifies the social justice that the paragraph 90 on the draft um, say just transition, but it's not just transition. It's not low carbon uh, future that we seek because it hinders uh, re that the recycling goals or renewable energy goals and it's known that incinerators have tremendous health and environmental consequences. However, the draft does not have any reference or criteria that refers to the Stockholm Convention, a legally binding instruments, uh, international instruments uh, to protect human health. One of the most toxic pollutants that emits from the incinerator is uh, dioxin and furan. And this is not regulated in the draft policy as well. And lastly, on just transition, that um, we are, they are not respecting environmental country system. For example, uh, we found WT project in Philippines and Sri Lanka to be conflict in their national laws and regulation on renewable energy and waste management. In the Philippines, uh, they have Renewable Energy Act defines that waste to energy technologies only should refer to the biodegradable material uh, and not the plastic fraction. Um, the Philippines also have ecological solid waste management that push for segregation, reduction, yet waste to energy requires a lot of feedstock and creates lock-in effect. And last part, 
waste to energy is a waste of energy, waste of public money at global level. It severely affects people and planet, and ADB should exclude waste, waste to energy from its energy policy and all its investment and stop all plan or ongoing waste to energy projects immediately. Thank you. Thank you, Yobel. I think the ADB has a lot to learn from Gaia on waste to energy and how to approach it. And I hope all the effort you're putting in is not actually wasted on the ADB. Um, but uh, there's plenty also to learn about um, inclusive, meaningful consultation. And we are saying uh, very prominently, nothing less than an inclusive, meaningful consultation. Uh, is, um, uh, is acceptable. Uh, I'll call upon Kate Geary, Recourse's co-director, to, to tell us what Recourse wants to say to the ADB. Thanks very, very much, uh, Vidya, and good morning, uh, and good evening, and good afternoon to you all. Um, just first, I, I do want to state that Recourse, which is, is based in, in Europe and works internationally, um, that we're 100% in solidarity with our allies in Asia and internationally who are boycotting this sham consultation with ADB today. ADB knows how uh, to organize a real consultation and it knows that we know. Um, so this is a really cynical move by ADB to sideline voices from the region. Um, and that's why we very much welcome this parallel session today. Um, I'd like to just take a, a couple of minutes to outline some key concerns about ADB's indirect lending. So these, this is the investments that the bank makes through third parties like banks or private equity funds or infrastructure funds. And our point is that any energy policy adopted by the ADB will be meaningless unless its provisions apply both to ADB's direct financing and to its indirect financing. So like many other public uh, development banks, since the financial crisis of 2008, ADB has stepped up its support to the financial sector or financial intermediaries known as FIs. In the decade after the financial crisis, ADB actually increased its lending to FIs tenfold. And today its active FI portfolio uh, counted since 2009, stands at over 6 billion, supporting um, 86 clients. And some of you will be familiar with the problems with FI lending at other institutions like the International Finance Corporation. And the good news is that ADB's portfolio doesn't seem to be as bad as the IFC's, but the bad news is that ADB's FI investing is far less transparent even than IFC's. So it's very difficult to see where the money ends up on the ground. That is a significant black hole for $6 billion in public money. Um, we've done a quick review of the 86 FI, active FI investments and nearly every single one had vital social and environmental information withheld. This is simply unacceptable and it's lagging behind current good practice at other institutions. So demand number one for change must be that ADB publishes the name, sector and location of all high and medium risk projects that it supports through FIs. Otherwise, no one will be able to track and monitor ADB's fossil fuel commitments. Without transparency reforms, we'll simply have to believe ADB that no FI money is going to coal or other fossil fuels. Despite the good news I mentioned, we did find several FI investments in ADB's portfolio that raised red flags. And let me quickly outline three examples, a bank, a private equity, uh, a private equity fund, and an infrastructure fund. So ADB um, has invested $400 million in two banks in India, Axis Bank and Yes Bank, and both of these banks are heavily invested in coal. ADB's money is not directed towards uh, those fossil fuel investments, but nevertheless, that is a hefty investment in two of uh, the biggest banks in India that, which are currently financing coal. 
Another investment is to the private equity fund Clifford Capital. And Clifford Capital is involved in gold and copper mining, oil drilling, oil shuttle tankers, and gas power plants, LNG and oil power plants. Finally, we also flagged ADB's investment in India's National Infrastructure Investment Fund, um, which will be familiar to many of you as this is one of the first FIs that the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank invested in. And Indian NGOs have expressed deep concerns about the NIIF, not least about its partnership with uh, NTPC, a company which runs 24 coal plants in India. And this leads me to another demand to ADB over FIs, that we must have robust exclusions for fossil fuels, including coal, oil and gas, that apply to both its direct and its indirect lending. As ADB emphasizes more and more support for the private sector, and as it switches its support more and more from coal to, to gas, the dangers from FI investing will only grow. So action on this issue is really urgent. Many thanks. Thank you, Kate, for flagging that very, very important point. We know that um, uh, the ADB has always been very gung-ho about the private sector. Now that we have FIs, um, there's plenty um, for us to keep looking at and really digging up more and more dirt. Thank you, Kate, for, to you and your team for doing that. Um, meanwhile, as we here are discussing what to look out for uh, and the direction that the ADB is headed, what we do know is that their um, consultation, their roundtable, which is a virtual consultation with the CSO, um, uh, with CSOs is on what they call energy policy consultation one. And um, uh, some reports that we are getting is, uh, is uh, telling us that it's basically uh, Director Yongping Zai there, together with Chris Morris of the NGO Center, and most of them uh, are the energy staff of the ADB. So basically, they're speaking and listening to themselves, um, which is obviously, so everyone uh, so apparently there is this push that we are talking about um, that they are having on the inside on waste to energy, on gas, on large grids, on private sector, large hydro, and of course, FIs. So um, everything that we thought this will be about is what is playing out there. And, uh, and as you know, uh, the consultation is happening on a conference app, not like in a Zoom uh, meeting. Uh, so you cannot actually um, uh, have a meaningful consultation because um, uh, the NGO forum spoke to the technical coordinator of the event and um, they did tell us very specifically that questions or, or comments can be only sent in via type in uh, typing into the chat box and people cannot actually voice out comments um, or dialogues or questions. That is why we decided there is no space for us and we do not want to legitimize their uh, round table by trying to be present um, there. So uh, we we'll leave them to their internal discussion and let's open up and um, uh, let me call in Knud from Urgewald in Germany, who have also been looking at many, many um, banks who've also been speaking to the EDs of several banks. Um, Knud, what do you have to say to the ADB and where they're headed and, and this kind of shoddy process that they are following, what, what Kate called a sham and what we all think is a sham. Um, what do you think, Knud? Yeah, hi, good morning, good day, uh, everybody. Well, uh, um, this uh, so-called consultation, uh, using a webinar and calling, calling this a consultation uh, reminds me of, of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank who tries to do uh, similar things. Uh, uh, so uh, that's a really bad precedent. And I think um, on top of having this SEF and, and, and saying, okay, we try to include uh, a consultation, uh, they are simply misusing the whole COVID situation uh, to restrict a meaningful uh, consultation. And without uh, a good discussion on, on 
on uh, topics uh, and, and a broad discussion. Uh, uh, that's not a consultation. That's just yeah, uh, it's so something like a trickle down of of, of their uh, uh, things. And I think uh, uh, the ADB in general, when you look at the energy and my my dear colleagues uh, uh, pointed out a lot of things, is that that they are trying to have a green spin uh, uh, without foundation in reality. And, and uh, so that's something that, that uh, uh, we, we can uh, point out. And they are forgetting that uh, um, the, the NGO community worldwide now is uh, uh, so well aligned that uh, we use a lot of tools to really analyze what they are, what they are doing. And we're looking uh, deeply into things that are, they are trying to hide, like Kate just pointed out, and always find uh, things. And uh, uh, um, my, uh, my take on is that uh, um, despite they're trying to greenwash what they are now calling uh, uh, their new energy approach is that, well, the fossil fuels uh, are still prevailing. Thank you. So, uh, Knud, you 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 finished, didn't you? Or did you yes. mute yourself? Yes. Yes. Okay. I did. Perfect. <laughs> Nora you. is here, but I'm presuming that uh, she's not going to speak. Um, we, uh, Godsen, do you want to say a thing or two from PSI? There are many groups like APMDD and others who have also supported the NGO Forum's position. Um, and uh, yes, so, uh, so um, Tanya is reporting that uh, now Director Zai is asking the ADB staff um, uh, to act as specialists on climate and on the consultation and, and asking them to speak because really they do not have anyone on the table to speak. Mm -hmm. Yes, so um, here, uh, Suzanne was here, but I think she has to run for another meeting. So um, Heather Nicholson coming in. I think I'll give um, the forum uh, executive director the last word here, because um, I know that South Asia was very keen to disengage, but initially the forum said they will sit in. And, uh, and then I'm very glad that all of us have actually decided to stand out and show uh, the ADB that this process that they are doing is really something very unacceptable and that they will have to rethink their whole strategy. Uh, where to from now? Yeah, I get asked that question just about everywhere I go these days. Where to from now? Um, well, just looking at my inbox the last couple of days ago, we just got our ADB gas portfolio analysis draft paper in. So that's definitely where we're going next in terms of the advocacy. And I think it's perfect timing from our friends in uh, SEED to come up with that. Uh, we will definitely host a webinar specifically on ADB's gas portfolio. Uh, and of course, allow our friends from the ADB to come in as well and maybe have a conversation. Uh, see, taking a bird's eye view at all of this, um, including this disengagement, it's important to see why we are all doing this. I mean, the only reason why we're doing this is to influence the board members to make changes in the energy policy so that the final policy which comes out is a very strong policy which clearly carves out a pathway for ADB to transition out of fossil fuels into real renewables, which is solar and wind, right? So keeping that entire game in mind, I would strongly suggest that we continue creating very critical analysis to influence this draft. I mean, just because we're disengaged, we should not be taking that as our default position that we are not engaging. We're very much engaging in this process. We are really looking to wrestle around this policy and make sure we have a very strong energy policy. Can we get them from fossil fuel, coal to renewable, direct transition? Can it become a climate finance renewable energy bank? And I think the last 
seven months, the political climate around energy financing globally has drastically shifted. Even, even five months ago, if you were going to say you want an immediate gas ban on ADB, I would say, nah. But now I think it's, it's very much in reach. So if we can all push this envelope as hard as we can, we might get somewhere where we might surprise ourselves. So keep up the good work. And I'm really glad that all of you could join. Um, looking at the parallel session at the ADB, a round table, which is not round at all, uh, clearly shows that they've been called out flat. Uh, it will be interesting to hear what happens between the board of directors and Yongping trying to explain himself about the ASEF consultation with NGOs because our letter is there. So yeah, thanks everyone. And thank you Vidya for an excellent moderation. Uh, thanks Ryan. I just had to step in, as you know. Uh, so, um, but we are so glad that we had so many around the table who have looked so closely and worked so closely on um, ADB projects and policies and showing them up for what they truly are. Uh, it's a very lonely roundtable consultation that the ADB is doing right now. Um, we are much more populous here and Asia will keep pushing back to make the Asian Development Bank, uh, as uh, Ryan said, uh, a, a, a truly green climate uh, renewable bank. Now, that's the only way they'll stay relevant. Otherwise, they will just uh, be so irrelevant, even, they ha uh, even though they've been a big player in the region until now. Uh, they need to bison up, pull up their, um, their socks and, and move towards, uh, to move in the right direction. We will keep pushing them. Maybe Jen, we should have a photograph, I think. We have this wonderful um, uh, placard behind us that Jen has um, created for us. Um, I think it deserves a photograph. So um, yes, maybe after yes. you close, you close for the live stream. Then we have the photos. Okay, okay, yes. So 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 let's close the right a live stream with fists that we will keep. Knud, I don't see your fist up. Yes, Nora. There, <laughs> Nora is going right at us, right at the ADB. <laughs> yes. Den, Chinara, Den, Chinara, Nadine. Chinara. Nadine, oh, Shakil, yeah. and Heather. Yes. Let's end strongly. We shall continue to push the ADB. Yes, okay. Nadine. All right. In three. What two. about you, Jen? Oh, wait, wait. Oh, yes, Jen. <laughs> Sorry, Not no, I cannot you. because the capture button is on. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, let's close. Done. Hey. Yeah, thank thank you. you, thank you, thank you all. Let's keep doing this, trying to keep the ADB relevant, inclusive, and um, pushed into consultation mode, which is truly meaningful. Thank you.